Good. Um, actually, Chuck, do you want to, can we airplay it uh, on, that, on that TV? Can you put it up on, and just um, airplay Yurik Beya? Yeah, I don't have uh, Wi-Fi here though. Or I don't have the, is it secured? Um, actually, if you, if you go to it, I will let you in. HTC, come on, pop up. Well, it's not pop up, okay, hold this real quick. Sure. Oh, he's got it. That should be it. We're starting with Coptic. Uh, just go to, we'll go to Coptic Reader, we'll go to Egbea, we'll just choose, choose the third hour, and then I usually start with our father, we go from there. I'll wait. <laughs> Oops. Okay. There we go. Let me do it. Sorry, guys. Uh, nope. Uh, go right there. Let me go right there. We're gonna go to settings. More than you ever wanted to know about this. All right, we're going to go to landscape. We're going to make your. Perfect. Yep, but hold on. We got to still make your font size a little bit bigger. Sorry, Alex. I'm just totally man manhandling your phone here. There we go. That should be fine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Make us worthy to play thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thy is kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Make us worthy. Let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, Lord the God, our Father, the Pontificator, to guard us in all peace this holy day and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord, God, the Pontificator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of the wicked man, and the rising up of the enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people, and from this holy place, because we are good and profitable, do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through the grace, compassion, love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you, with him and the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, with us with you at all times and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy, according to the multitudes of your compassions. Blot out my iniquity, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil before you, that you might be found just in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth. You have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face, and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways, and the ungodly man shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. 
For if you desire sacrifice, I would have given it. Do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart. God, you shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your pleasure to Zion. Let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we may come into your house, Lord, the place that is always open for us, Lord, the place you're always willing to receive, Lord. You are a great God and a big God. And we ask that your presence just fill this upper room with us right now, Lord. Lord, I ask that you, that your message is delivered today, Lord, and, and not a message that's given for the congregation, but for us individually, Lord. I ask that you wrestle with our hearts this morning, Lord, if there's aspects of our life that you want to bring light into, Lord. I ask that you give us the spirit of obedience, Lord, and courage to do that, Lord, because we know that you have a great plan for every single one of us, Lord. You are our creator, and you know why we were created, Lord. I ask that you give us the ability to walk into that calling. I ask that you speak through me, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver to your people, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you overlook our shortcomings, Lord, but that you forgive us our sins. In the session of our saints and our tears, here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory of our never. All right, guys, so I will tell you, you guys pulled a quick one on me, that one, because I know that I did most of the reading in that, or I'll say the praying in that, but I will tell you, we had technical difficulties, so I won't give you guys all of the burden of responsibility on that, but I will say that it's a lot harder to read the screen when you're way in the back. So you do your part, I'll do my part, hopefully we'll all be okay. We have a bunch of chairs open in the front if anybody does want to kind of make their way in the front instead of kind of standing or sitting uncomfortably in the back. Um, all right. I guess Happy New Year's. I guess this is kind of like the first one we've had, so happy 2023. Um, I have this really bad memory of one time I was sitting up here at the beginning of 2022, and um, I'm giving this great talk on like, you know, I thought it was great. Uh, I was giving this talk. I was very passionate about like, you know, 2020 and 2020 vision and all this stuff for 2020 and about so optimism and like, you know, how 2020 is going to be a great year. And I remember I'm sitting here and I'm talking and my iWatch vibrates, right? So I, I look at it. Is it really low? You guys can't hear in the back? It's OK, yeah, I guess. So is that better? But the problem is, is I think I have to move because these speakers are going to give me feedback. Is that better? Can you guys hear me in the back? Actually, that's a bad question. Does, is everybody that wants to be able to hear me able to hear me? Because there's some people in the back that probably couldn't care less because they're just having their donuts. But so um, I will tell you, like one of those burnt in memories was I was up here and my iWatch goes off and I'm sitting there giving this message and I look at it and I just see like Kobe died. Right. And I just, you know, and I kind of like dismissed it. I, I thought, you know, I didn't really want to think about it too much. And then I was just like, man, that's a bad way to start 2020. But then it all went downhill from there, right? Like 2020 was just like, it was like a rough year. Um, so I'm hoping, and I say this leeringly, but like I'm hoping that 2023 is a much, like it's a great year because we've had a couple of doozies. So um, I'm hoping this is going to be a good year. And I'm also going to be honest that we're, we just wrapped up one of my, um, my favorite seasons of the entire year. Like I think that I love the idea of the nativity. Um, I know that you guys have, you know, we were, we were going through the Abuna Metamaskin book about the nativity, about the feast, and um, then we came back and then we had the, you know, the, the potluck, or well, it wasn't the potluck, but our fellowship meal last week, and I just felt like I had one more nativity talk in me, okay? So I just have to get it out, and kind of it is what it is. But, um, but not just about the nativity, but about the fact that, like, you know, I love the, the period that the nativity happened, right? Like, I, I can get lost in just thinking about, like, the state of the church when, like, the nativity was about to happen. Um, so I was kind of, I was thinking about that. And um, Bible trivia, this should be a somewhat easy one. I hope you guys know it. The last book in the Old Testament. What is it? Do you say Acts? Oh, Matthew, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone, last book in the Old Testament. It's not a very well-known book. 
Okay, Malachi, right? So we all know that Malachi's were kind of like the last book of the Bible before we have the Nativity, because we know the Nativity pops up at the very beginning of the Gospels. Um, does anyone know the time difference from Malachi to, to the Gospels? Roughly? 400 years. Yeah, about 400 years of darkness, right? Where we have no written anything about kind of what's going on. And the crazy part is, is like you figure that's 400 years of kind of like silence. I'm sure God was working, but it's not recorded. But the book of Malachi was a very, very dark book. Um, and the entire reason that the book of Malachi was like written is it was God reminding the, the nation of Israel that like, hey, you guys are like, you guys have big time gone astray. Like we've, we've got problems, right? Because it was talking about in the nation of Israel, there was so much wickedness that was going on, on at that time. Like the people were wicked. You know, it talks about the fact that, you know, Malachi was addressing them as an adulterous nation who turned their back on God. In chapter 2, uh, Malachi 2.8, it says, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? Right? So you get this idea that, and he's writing this to the Jews. Like this was like, the, you know, this was his people. And he's basically saying, like, you are robbing me. And wrap your mind around the fact that, like, God is telling his people that you are robbing me. Like, who in their right mind would ever rob God? And if you're going to steal, like, steal from somebody else, right? Like, don't steal from God. And to be honest with you, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of parallels when I was thinking about the book of Malachi and kind of like reading back through it. There's a lot of stuff going on here that reminds us of like stuff that we can see is directly applicable to how we're living today, right? Because if you, if you really think about it, right, like as a nation, right, like we rob God all the time, right? I remember I went on my, uh, my son's eighth grade DC trip, right? And I'm, I remember we're there and we're reading like a, a lot of the original documents and the constitution and, and we're, learning, we're learning about all the forefathers. And it was very much a nation kind of like built on like a Christian perspective, right? And a Christian worldview and Christian beliefs. And you'd see like in the early writings that they're talking about God all the time. And I think about where we are now. And I said, I wonder if God kind of looks at us and he says, like, you guys are robbing me. Like, you guys are robbing me. Like, I gave you guys something beautiful, right? But we steal from God, right? We steal praise from him. We steal time that's due to him. We steal money from him. Like, we do all of this stuff. And I just wonder, like, wow. You know, now you start thinking about, we don't let God go anywhere anymore. Like, he's not allowed in our schools. He's not allowed in our government. He's not allowed in, in anything. And it's crazy when you start thinking about that, right? And I was thinking, I, I, I had this great example, right, where... I apologize if, I, if you guys have heard me use this before, but it was such a good example where, um, where we started thinking about like, you know, stealing money from God. Um, and I know that you guys know, and if, if you've heard me speak about this before, I am like adamant about like tithing. I think tithing is like a requirement. I think it's somewhere that God shows up. If you look at the whole, you know, if you look at the whole Bible, there's only one time that God basically says, try me or like test me, and it comes to the tithe. And he says that like, you know, I will bless you with blessings upon blessings. So I was thinking about this, right? And I heard this as an example of this certain way. It says, imagine that you have somebody who's coming, like, you know, like if I have a family member who's visiting from Egypt, right? So he, he's come, he's got an international driver's license, and he says, hey, Pete, you know, um, yeah, I'm going to be here for like a month or two, or whatever. And I say, hey, we've got this extra car. Why don't you just, you know, take the car? You have an international driver's license. You can kind of drive it around. It's going to be kind of your thing. And, and, and I gave him the key. And I said, and you know what? Honestly, it's a spare car. I don't care about it. Take it wherever you want, you know, come, go, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about it at all, right? Treat it like it's your car. And I can imagine that that family member comes back right before he goes back to Egypt, right? And he says, Peter, can you sit down? Like, I want to, I want to talk to you about something. I said, all right, cool, right? So I sit down and he says, you know, I've been thinking about it really hard. You've been such a good guy. You know, you've been very hospitable I and mean, you let me stay with you some time, you know, this and that and all this stuff. And he says, you know, I really wanted to give you this car before I leave as a token of my appreciation. Right? What do you think my response would be? That's my car. That's my car, <laughs> idiot. Right? Like, I would be like, that makes absolutely no sense, right? Um, because you can't give me what's already mine, right? But I feel like a lot of times with our money, that's what we do, right? Like, God gives us, right? And we give him back a small portion of it, and we say, man, you did a great job, right? But the reality of it is, like, you know, and I, and I love this because the book of Malachi even kind of hones in on this, right? It says that we steal from God, right? So one of my things I'm going to tell you is like, you know, 
when I was reading the darkness that was going on in the time, what I wanted and what I was praying for is like, let 2023 be a bright year, right? And like in every aspect of our life, no darkness, no stealing. Give God everything that's due to him, whether it be your time, your money, your, um, the praise that's due to him that we often don't give him, right? And the special thing about like the book of Malachi now, which just highlights how dark it was back then, in Malachi 1.6, it says, to you priests who despise my name, you offer defiled food on my altar, and you offer the blind as a sacrifice. You offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? You wanna talk about a dark time? Even the priests were corrupt. Even the priests were filled with darkness. Even the priests that were assigned to care for the things of God were caring for themselves. Such a dark time. Right? And the sorriest part of this book, that throughout the whole book, there seems to be no sign of repentance. Right? Like, you would hope that somewhere in this book you see it turn around and that people start repenting and start trying to do what's right, but there's not. Like, the wickedness in this book continues. God does carve out a section where he speaks sweet words to the faithful. Because one of the things we have to remember is no matter how dark things are around us, no matter how bad it is when we turn on the news or when you're scrolling your Instagram, no matter how bad it all is, that God will never forget his faithful. But we live in dark times. We live in dark times. And I believe that we live in arrogant times. And I believe that everyone's full of pride and there's a lot of ignorance. And... A lot of the times, and I think this is very, very true, you know, I would love to say just outside, but if, if we were honest, even inside of our own lives, there are times even in our own lives where we think we know what's better than God. And we think like, yeah, we know that God has a plan. We know that God has a play. We know that God, God says we need to do it this way. But in our minds, we said, but if I could just do it this way, I think that's going to be even better. And the thing is, you know, in 314, it says, it is, they, even, they even tell Malachi, I said, it is useless to serve God. What's the profit that we have kept as ordinance? And it's sad to see the level of darkness that they had achieved in that point in time. And then the kicker, you know, in our theme with nativity is that darkness continues for 400 years. 400 years. So you can imagine, you know, what it's like. And I believe that those 400 years got even darker and darker and darker because when we pick up the state of, you know, the, the Jewish church or, you know, the Jewish religion, at, by the time of the Gospels, does it look different? Yeah, we have all of these new players who have come to the scene, right? Like, you don't see the scribes and the Pharisees and these people like in the other places in the Old Testament. So you can imagine that it got way darker, right? But I will tell you, when that darkness broke, boy, did that darkness break. You know, John 1, 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it, right? And I will tell you, 2,000 years ago, God's followers' heart were hard. The people who were looking for him were the people that totally missed him. They had turned away from the truth, and they started doing things of whatever they wanted. And they totally missed the light. They didn't even comprehend it. I love the way it's put in Joshua 17, um, sorry, Judges 17.6. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I love that verse. You know, and that's not just a verse that was applicable in the book of Judges, because I feel that even when we start thinking about the darkness that we see everywhere around us today, right? Why is it so dark? Because there's no king. There's no king in Israel, and everyone right now is doing what's right in their own eyes. We have no absolute truth. We will not be able to talk about, like, God's plan, God's standards, God anything else. Everyone wants to do whatever they see is right, and shame on you if you're going to tell someone else that they're wrong. Like, that's the level that we got to. And it freaks me out because when you read that verse, there's something that it says no king, right? Well, when you have no king, guess who leads? You lead. And you're not going to listen to anybody above you. And that's a very scary place to be. And I'm going to tell you, not only is it scary in our own lives, right? Because Satan attacks leadership. One of the things that, that you'll see throughout the Bible is Satan attacks leadership, right? Like, Satan's efficient. Why am I going to go on individual attacks on low-level people when I can attack leadership and then everyone will scatter? Pray for your priests. Pray for a hierarchy. You have to understand that, you know, all of the divisions, these are all attacks 
So we need to pray for them. We need to pray for unity. I'm going to tell you something to say, pray for your priests. Like they need unity, right? They all need unity. Our hierarchy, bishops, popes, everyone needs unity in the church because when that stuff attacks, it all trickles down. And I'm going to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you, you know what else you need to pray for? Pray for marriages. Pray for homes. You know, you know what Satan's best attack on your kids are? It's you. It's you. If he can divide mom and dad, then the kids are vulnerable. He always attacks leadership, and we have to be responsive, we have to be protected, and we have to care. Right? <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, once we start ruling over our own lives, we make a lot of stupid mistakes. And we have to be honest with that. You know, it's amazing what happens when we start losing absolute truth in our life. And this book is full of statutes, commandments, principles to follow, and it's for that for a reason. It is to protect us from ourselves. Because if you decided that you're just going to follow and do whatever you wanted to do, I guarantee you that there's going to be just catastrophic mistakes on the other side of that. So that's what this book is for, right? I love Psalm 19.7. It says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making, the, uh, making wise of the simple. Like, we don't need to overthink things, guys. I would be glad to be simple. Just let me be simple, right? Just simple and follow the book, and I promise you we'll all be the wisest people around, right? Because what that means to me is that I need a leader. Let me be simple and just let somebody else be my leader, and I will follow their commandments and their statutes, everything that's found in this book. Because I will tell you that this book also has a ton of case studies of what happens when you abandon God's plan. We see it again and again and again, and these are real stories. You think about the case studies, you know, I can tell you what happened to King David. As great as he was, when he departed from the statutes of God, what happened? Huge mistakes. Huge, huge effects that affected his family, his relationships. You know, it affected thousands of deaths under his watch in his nation, right? You look at Samson, we see what happened there. As much potential as Samson had, as much that he could have done great things, he allowed compromise to creep into his life. He made some bad decisions and it all fell apart for him. And we see it time and time again throughout this book. You know, I think a lot of us, we can talk about the, the case studies, but we don't need to. Like, you have case studies outside of this book. You have case studies that happen in your own life where you basically said, yeah, I knew I shouldn't have done that or I knew that I was playing with fire here, or yeah, I let a compromise happen there, and you saw what happened from that. Way more powerful, and we've paid way heavier prices in our own life. And a lot of the times it's because we thought we could get away with it, but we will never get away with it. We will always pay the price. But I'm gonna tell you that there's a beautiful thing, and it's the darkest times in your life can be setting the stage for the greatest light you've ever seen. And that reminds me of what we're talking about with this, this gap in Malachi, right? I'm sure that people were looking you know, at the Jewish religion at that time and they were just thinking like, it can't get any worse than this. It's never been darker than this. We can't even get a prophet, right? And they were so upset and they were probably so hopeless and so full of despair. But that darkness was setting the stage for the greatest light that could ever show up. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest enjoy, joys that I have in my life is being a dad. I love being a dad, right? It's one, it's one of my, I just, I just enjoy every aspect of it. But there's some things I can't say I enjoy every aspect of it because some aspects of it really stink, right? Because dad always has to be the brave guy, right? Like when they see something that's scary or there's a noise or there's a bug or there's something like that, you know, do they ever call mom? Especially if there's a bug, right? And I'll tell you, out of all of the things that I hate to do, one of the things I really, really, really hate to do is um, walk into dark areas to check it out. Like, you never outgrow that. I don't know. Maybe you did. I haven't. We'll just kind of call it what it is. But I will tell you a funny story about our marriage early, early on. Don't worry. I look bad in the story, not you. Um, but it was, like, it was like at 2 o'clock in the morning, and our alarm goes off in the, like, the middle of the house, right? So, um, so we wake up kind of like puzzled. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I go to the alarm thing, and it says that there's been an entry point breached at the downstairs like entrance from the garage, right? And then the, automatically the thought is, if a robber was going to come in, that's probably where they come in from, right? 
So then the phone rings and it's Brinks. So, you know, and they're like, hey, you know, what's going on? We got this alarm. And I was like, yeah. They're like, what is it? And I was like, I have no idea, you know, but there's, it sounds like there's somebody downstairs at my house. So he said, okay, sir, we're going to need you to go downstairs and check that out. <laughs> and all I'm thinking is, what do I pay you $35 a month for? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I could have done that without you, like, ever even, like, what is the purpose of this phone call, right? And I was terrified because I didn't know when I went downstairs what I was going to find, right? So, um, so I went downstairs and I had my mag light and I was like ready because um, I had no idea what I was going to find. And luckily, by the grace of God, everything was fine. It was a long story. Um, but it was the wind that kind of blew the door open because probably my wife didn't close the door all the way, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but I had no idea what I was going to find. And here's a thought for you is Christ came down knowing exactly what he was going to find. And that blows my mind. He knew how dark the world was. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He was willing himself to enter into that darkness at himself being a flashlight. He knew what was going to be exposed. He knew it was not going to be pretty. He knew how people were not going to react and how people were going to treat him. He knew that it would cost him his life and the death of a cross, but he did it anyways. And that blows my mind when I start thinking about like the nativity. You know, and I will tell you, there's a lot of times where that, that's, that story sounds great, right? We start thinking about the fact that we love that God came down and he walked into all of that. He knew what he was getting into. He knew the price that was going to be paid. And because his love for you and his love for me, that he was willing to endure all. But I'm going to tell you another story that happened at my house that I feel like this is a little bit more of what we do. Okay. And I remember at our old house in Eastvale, we had these beautiful French doors put into our master bedroom. Um, and it kind of led out to the balcony. It looked really, really nice. And I remember there was a certain day I was kind of cleaning, and, um, but it was something that we did afterwards. It wasn't part of the original build. And uh, I was cleaning up my room, and I pulled back like one of the curtains, and I saw that like where the French door kind of went to like the baseboard. Um, yeah, that it was all kind of brown, like the, the wood was kind of eaten up a little bit. And um, yeah, it definitely did not look normal. And do you know what I did? Any ideas? I put the curtain back. Yeah, I was just like, yeah, not today. It's just not going to happen, right? Like, I don't want to deal with this. That looks expensive. I don't even want to, like, I just don't want to deal with it, right? And I feel like that's how we treat a lot of areas of our life as well. Like, we'll notice it. We'll see it. We'll say, that's probably, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look like that's supposed to be there, right? But, the, but here's the thing is I didn't want to start digging because I didn't want to see how bad it really was, right? Because if I realized how bad it really was, I would have to deal with it. And I think, I think it would have been expensive. And I think that's the way a lot of us deal with the, like the dark areas of our life, that we'd rather just kind of turn a blind eye to it. And I think we all have discussions and issues that we avoid because we don't want to expose ourselves to what that could mean. It could be painful. It could hurt. It could create a headache. So we play it safe on the neutral ground because we are terrified of what exposure would do. But I will tell you that exposure is the best case scenario. A lot of the time we think like, I can't expose that, it's gonna to be too bad. But I am telling you that not exposing it is where things go wrong. That's when things start getting very, very expensive. Because Christ, Christ always exposed. He came here and he openly exposed, he exposed evil, he shined his light on it, and when his light hit that evil, it was healing. You know, because Christ himself, he came to bring light. And I want you guys to think about that. Like, if you guys think about what 2023 is going to be for you, I pray that it be a year so full of light, of Christ's light. Because a lot of the times, if you even think about how Christ performed his ministry, he never shied away from things at all. Like the easy topics, the hard topics, the good people, the bad people, he never shined away at all. And I love it, right? Because many of the Jews, do you think that like a lot of like the normal Jews knew the hypocrisy of the Pharisees? Do you think they knew that they were hypocrites? Let me ask you this. In your life, do you know who's a hypocrite? Yeah, we call that out, right? Like, I got my seven-year-old who can call out hypocrisy in my life with no, <laughs> with no er like, errors at all. He's spot on, right? So I'm telling you that I believe that the Jews knew that the Pharisees were hypocrites. But they just had no idea how to deal with it. They didn't know how to expose that. Did Christ know? 100%. To their face, he called them out. Right? He knew they were hypocritical, and he was bold, and he called them out openly. 
But you see like the boldness of Christ on one side on how he dealt with that, but I love to see his boldness on the other side as well, right? Because what else did he do? Did he ever avoid the sick or the diseased? He never avoided it. What did he do? He brought his light there too, his healing light, right? Let me ask you, and now one of my favorite things, if you just go through the Gospels and you pull out all of the verses, and it says, and they brought all who were sick and he healed them. And he brought all, and they brought out all of those with infirmities and he healed them. And all who were sick were healed, right? Because when Christ's light shows up, it shows up in a beautiful way, in a miraculous way. The other thing, so you have the sick and the, and, and the diseased, right? But then it, who else, right? Did he ever shy away from the tax collectors and the prostitutes? Never. What did he bring? He brought his light, right? And what happened when his light came into contact with the tax collectors and the, prostit the prostitutes? They found healing. They found comfort. They found newness. They found forgiveness. And that's what I love. I love when Christ comes, he brings all of his light with him. It's his light is his light of a love, of healing, of peace. And I will tell you, we would never, ever, ever appreciate that light if we did not understand the darkness. And I will tell you, if you do not acknowledge that there is darkness in your life, if you cannot pinpoint in your life where there is darkness, then chances are you don't need his light either and you will never receive it. You have to know where the darkness is for Christ to shine. And that's what this season, the nativity was like all about, right? The world was dark, it was so dark, 400 years darker than the book of Malachi. And in the, in the book of Malachi, things were already bad. The priests, the people, everyone needed light. And that's when it happened. His birth that changed everything, right? The light of the world came to shine for everyone to see. And my favorite part of like doing Bible studies or where people will invite me to other churches and I basically say, hey, come give a talk. My favorite thing about it, right, is meeting people and hearing their stories. I love it when people come and they say, hey, you know what, like, you know, hearing from broken people, lost people, womanizers, manonizers, you know, people who were broken, living in complete sin. But then the light of the world came into their life. It's my favorite thing in the world. If you ever want to be energized in one way or another, hear somebody's testimony. Have somebody tell you, like, this is the way I was living and this is the way I was living now. This is when I was happening, but then this happened and it changed everything. It is the most beautiful thing. It'll make you realize how big our God is, how real our God is right, and how much he loves us, especially the broken and the weak, the crippled, the lame, all of us, and the way that he, he loves on us. It's just, it blows my mind. So my thing is, is guys, like, let 2023 be a different year. Let it be a year where, like, there, there, there won't be an ounce of darkness in there. Not be an ounce of, and don't hide things. Don't put the curtains back over, over the baseboards, right, but actually lean into it. Right? And there's a lot of us that, you know, we might be thinking, well, you know what, Peter, I'm trying. I'm trying to do my part. But, you know, God, you know, God hasn't met me there. And I'm going to tell you that every question that you have or almost every question that you have, there's answers for it in this book. You know, I think a lot of the times we have all these questions and we're waiting for God's email. But it doesn't happen that way. He's going to tell you, get in the word. Everything that you need is in this word. Right? Everything that we need is in the church. Everything that we need, we have all of the resources, but we are too stubborn to use it. Because I love James 4, 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the thing I love about that verse is like, it's telling you that someone wants it even more than you do. And I will tell you again, as a father, no matter how many times, and, and, and I don't know if your kids still do this, it might be just because my kids are young. Um, actually, I think Nathaniel's probably grown out of it. But my younger kids will swear to me that they love me more than I love them. And as a parent, is that possible? Never in a million years. A parent's heart is a parent's heart all day long, right? No matter how much they tell me that they love me more than I love them, like I'm dad, right? And I'm gonna tell you it's the same way that God's desire for you will always be greater than your desire for him. If you ever think that you are pursuing him and that he is not responding, I challenge you on that because he wants it more than you want it. He will make it happen. And a lot of the times people will be like, but Peter, you know, you said that if I draw near to him, he will draw near to me. And I'm going to tell you, the problem is, is we love what I call James 4.8a, right? That's, that's the things a lot of people don't, that's only half the verse, right? James 4.8a, but they never make it to the second half of the verse, which is cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
That doesn't feel as good as the first part, does it? Like, I'm not, like, if you want to put one of them on a t-shirt, it's going to be the other one, right? Like, the first half, but it's that, that promise isn't complete without that second half, right? And if I can translate the cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, if I could translate for you in the Peter International Version, what that basically means is get out of the dark. Get out of the dark. Don't let there be areas of dark in your life. Walk in light. You want to know why we don't see him, why we don't hear him, because we don't experience him? Well, the answer is in Isaiah 59 too. It says, your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We cannot expect to have a close and intimate relationship with God while we keep all of the filth in our life that separates us from him. And the thing is, is like, look, does that mean that we've got to get clean before we go to God? No, without a doubt. But what it does mean is we have to offer a pure repentance. We have to show him that we have every interest, every intent, and we have to start making a way towards him. Start changing aspects of your life to show that that sin, that, that, that repentance is true and not just cheap words. Words are cheap because our God is always faithful. But if you choose to continue having darkness in your life, Christ can't show up. He is light, and he cannot be in a place of darkness. It will never work that way. But when he shows up, his light will eliminate the darkness. Because I love this meditation. It says, an entire dark room cannot overcome a single candle. Light always wins. And I love the fact that what led the wise men to Bethlehem was it anything other than a light. It was just a light, and these guys were Gentiles coming from far away. It was the light that led them. Right? They saw his innocence, his bright face, and it welcomed them. So what's that light? It was the star. The star, our star, the church, the Bible, our confession fathers, God, the people in our life, good counsel, you know, and they lead us to Jesus every single time. So my goal is for 2023. I hope that you guys agree. No darkness, only light. Because Christ came to eliminate the darkness. I'm going to leave it just with a very short story of my number two, right? And I remember when Elijah was about three, one thing about Elijah is he was terrified of the dark, right? I remember every single night, every single night I go and I tuck him into his bed and a little three-year-old Elijah would tell me, you know what, dad, Um, I'm scared. And as a dad, it would break my heart, right? Because you don't want your three-year-old to be scared. You don't want any of your kid, no matter the age, to be scared, right? Um, Because I don't want to be scared. And I think that every single one of us will acknowledge because we are all scared because of the darkness in our life. We're scared if that darkness becomes exposed. We are scared what will people think about us. We're scared because what will the consequences be? And we're all scared, right? But I just remember when Elijah, every single night, he'd be like, Papa, I'm scared. You know what I would do? We have a dimmer in that room. Let's turn on the lights a little bit, right? Just a little bit. You know, I didn't turn it on blinding. I didn't turn it on or it was going to wake him up right? Let's turn it on a little bit. So that's my encouragement for this week. Hopefully by the end of the year, there'll be a lot more light. But for this week, we just turn up the dimmer a little bit, put a little bit more light in there, be in your Bible a little bit more, pray a little bit more, confess your sins a little bit more, right? Share some stuff that you're struggling with. If it's been a while, call your confession father, do whatever you need to do. But can we turn up the light just a little bit? Because really, if you look at the whole season of the nativity, that's what it was all about, from darkness to light. And the only thing that changed that was his, was his presence. Amen? Yeah. All right, stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you're such a great God, Lord, such a big God, and you're a God who is so full of light, so full of goodness, so, so full of love, Lord, that we ask that allow us to receive that from you, Lord. Because so many times we're settling for so much less, Lord. We're settling for what the world has to offer us. We're settling us for second best or what we've convinced ourselves is good enough. But Lord, every single time we taste you, we know that nothing is better than you. So I ask that 2023 be a, be a year of light. Lord, where we confess our sins. Lord, where we put it all on the table, Lord. Because we know that it's worth it. It's worth it, Lord. We would trade any of this stuff to be in a deeper relationship with you. We get distracted, Lord. We make bad decisions that are very, very short-term. Lord, we worship our flesh, whatever it might be, Lord. But I ask that that you fill us, Lord. It's your promise where you said that 
You know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be filled, Lord. I'm asking to create that desire inside of us, the hunger and the thirst, so that we pursue you, Lord, that we are filled by you, Lord, and that we are not full of ourselves. I ask these things lifted through the session of all your saints from our chairs. Here's what we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.